Adam was new to human experiences, he knew he had never felt like this. While he had no name for it, he didn't like it. His stomach was fluttering, his face felt tight, his cheeks were hot, his throat constricted. It was even difficult to look at Eve. The former feeling of delight was gone. Instead, he felt some repulsion, a slight sense of nausea. She looked at him like she could see right through him and didn't like what she saw. Her relationship had seemed so natural and comfortable. Now they couldn't even talk to each other. He had felt free and safe, and now he felt bound and vulnerable and exposed. He felt the need to cover himself, to hide. <laughs> From what? From whom? So quietly, without any discussion while doing it, he and Eve made a covering for their bodies, and they hid. God would be taking an early evening stroll, and Adam, who had previously delighted in seeing his creator, now found himself gripped with human feelings that he would learn to call fear and guilt. The expected happened. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. What a fearful sound that must have been. Quiet steps on soft grass can be as shattering to the guilty as a slight sound to a migraine sufferer. The steps were jarring to those wounded and sensitive spirits. And although it might have been a call of a friend to a friend, where are you? It must have caused Adam to leap from his hiding place like a startled rabbit. And in the meeting of downcast eye with searching eye, Adam was now in the presence of the one whom he had betrayed. And the full intensity of that earlier feeling came. The face tightened even more, feeling as though it would split. The constriction in the throat made speech almost impossible. The words sounded dry and raspy, and Adam had an instinctive desire to throw up his hand to ward off a blow that he knew he deserved. I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Adam, who told you you were naked? The loss of innocence. Where does that come from? When do you know that you're naked? I mean, I remember as a child, if you innocently appeared without your clothes in the presence of those who were other than your parents, you're the adults around you would say, shame, shame. For the first time, maybe then, you felt you were naked. You felt shame for what you were because of others' discomfort. You were robbed of your innocence then by the shame of others. But that's not the guilt and shame of which I speak. Who told you you were naked? The real loss of innocence comes when we're legitimately responsible for circumstances in which we find ourselves and genuinely ashamed of our behavior. It's when that sense of nakedness comes from self-awareness from within. Our moral weakness has been exposed. Our true motivation has been revealed. Our a character deficiency has been made transparent. Suddenly, we are known for what we are for what we really think and how we really feel. When has that happened for you? When you told a lie and got caught? When you gossiped about a friend and hurt him or her? 
when you got drunk again after several promises to the one you loved, when you were unfaithful to your spouse, when you betrayed a friend. It happens when we have done something that we know is against what we say we believe. It happens when we fail someone who trusted us. And once it happens, we cower in the garden, fearful that the voice will be heard. Where are you? That voice might come through the voice of a parent, of a friend, one's child, one's spouse, or even one's community. You've been too quiet lately. Where are you? Have you been avoiding me? Where have you been? Why do you get angry so easily? Where are you? I was naked, and I hid myself. Who told you you were naked? We stumble and stutter like public officials we see these days and all others caught doing what they know is not right, making excuses, lying about what they know to be true and what others know to be true. So Adam, having placed himself in that position, stutters, the woman you gave me urged me, and I ate. It's Adam's way of saying to God, it's your fault for giving me this creature called woman. Besides, I didn't want it. It, I was pushed into it. I mean, does anyone, does anyone ever say, I did it because I wanted to? I chose to do it. I just wish I hadn't been caught. Does anyone ever say without being forced, now I see how I hurt others. What can I do to make amends? How refreshing that would sound. So there's something deeper here. Why the inability and unwillingness to confess and repent? When is it that we feel guilt and shame most deeply? It's that moment when we confront the person offended or when the person confronts us. You've all felt it. Someone calls you on something, and what's the first thing you think of? That shield of denial comes up in defensiveness, right? It's a human reaction to being caught. And behind the initial guilt is the shadow of the one that we have betrayed. And betrayal is always a personal matter, even if the person that we've betrayed is just ourselves. It's that pain that we want to run from. It's that judgment that we feel we deserve, but which we cannot bear. So when the confrontation finally happens, our first response is denial. Did you eat of the fruit of the garden? The woman you gave me urged me, and I ate. The serpent beguiled me. And I ate. The people that we have betrayed walk into the garden of our lives, and their footsteps make us shudder, fearful that they will ask the fateful words, have you eaten of the fruit of the garden? Did you cheat on the exam? Are you seeing another man? Are you drinking again? Did you tell the confidence? I shared. The confrontation happens. The pain of the guilt and shame is too great to sustain. The fear of judgment is too great. The response is almost always denial. Adam can't face the judgment that he has conferred upon himself. I mean, remember what God said? The day that you eat of the tree of the fruit of good and evil, you shall surely die. Adam expects to be killed on the spot if he confesses. But he discovers that his punishment actually isn't 
death in the way he expected it, but banishment. He and Eve are cast out of the garden, the place that they had experienced the intimate presence of God. Have you ever felt yourself far from feeling that kind of intimate presence of God? Well, I'm going to invite us to take another tack for just a minute, and we'll get back to the other question. Because this is a different reading than most of us, myself included, have of the Adam and Eve story. Most of us have heard this version. Adam and Eve are fresh off the assembly line. Shiny, new, perfect, the first human beings, sort of superhumans. And God tested those flawless creatures with this command, not to eat of the tree of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil, just to see if they meant business and would obey God. But they failed the test. They rebelled against God, and they lost not only their perfection, but also that of every other human being born since. Well, this way of understanding Adam, the Adam story, has been popular for a very long time in Western Christianity, especially under the influence of St. Augustine, who was about 3rd, 4th century, who said that not only did humanity inherit a sinful nature from Adam and Eve, but also the guilt of their actions, and that is how all humans are born. The doctrine of original sin. How many of you have heard that story? Another one, one often taken by Christians in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, is to read the Adam story as not being about a fall down from perfection, but a failure to grow up into godly wisdom and maturity. So think of Adam and Eve not as perfect superhumans, but as young, naive children who were meant to grow into obedience, but were tricked into following another path. So why would anyone read the story of Adam that way? Well, there are a few reasons, and they help us understand that actually we're reading the story of Israel Israel's history can be broken down as follows. Israel, the nation of Israel, is created by God at the Exodus through a cosmic battle. Gods of the Egyptians are defeated through the story of the plagues, and the Red Sea is divided and the Egyptian army is destroyed. The Israelites are given Canaan to inhabit, a lush land flowing with milk and honey. They remain in the land as long as they obey the Mosaic law. They persist in a pattern of disobedience and are eventually exiled to Babylon. So Israel's history parallels Adam's drama in Genesis. Adam is created in Genesis 2 after the taming of chaos in Genesis 1. Adam is placed in a lush garden. The law, not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, is given as a stipulation for remaining in the garden. Adam and Eve disobey, and they are exiled. Now, there are two ways, of course, of looking at this parallel. You could say that the Adam story came first, and then the Israelites just followed that pattern, but knowing that what we know, that Genesis was written as the Israel's, Israelites were returning from their exile to Babylon, there is another way of looking at it. Maybe Israel's history happened first, and the Adam story, remember they were trying to regain their identity? It was, it was written to reflect that history so they would remember who they were. In other words, the Adam story is really an Israel story placed in primeval time. It's not a story of human origins, but of Israel's origins. You see, knowing the difference between good and evil, that is the whole point of the Old Testament. 
the law given to Moses at Mount Sinai reveals to Israel what is good and what is evil. And if they obeyed God, things would go well with them and they would be able to stay in the promised land. If they disobeyed, it would lead to dire consequences, banishment, and ultimately exile from the land. So over and over again in the Old Testament, we read about this confrontation between God and the people of Israel. And at some points in the narrative, Israel takes responsibility for their actions, and they repent, and they are blessed by God. And at other points, Israel scapegoats or denies and experiences a withdrawal of blessedness when it listens to voices other than the voice of God. So what actually happens in the garden when things go awry? In Genesis chapter 3, we read about an alternate voice to the voice of God that is heard, that of a serpent a poisonous voice, if you will, one that suggests that maybe there's a shortcut to attaining the perks of godlike status and wisdom and human maturity. After all, the serpent of entitlement hisses. There's no reason why you can't be just like God, is there? God is deceiving you about that. Taking the shortcut won't harm you. In fact, it will make you more like God. Why should you have to spend so much time working for it, striving for it? Why shouldn't you have the best immediately without any cost or toil? Why shouldn't you have it all now? Why should you have to work for it, invest in it? Why shouldn't you have everything you want? You are, after all, you, created in the image of God. So God is no better than you. Why should you be subject to God when you can be at the same level as God, enjoying all the freedoms that God has? Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? The Jewish people call this poisonous voice Lashon Hara, the evil inclination, the curse of the tongue. It's a voice that prompts cravings for reward without investment, the awakening of expectant and entitled appetites, and a deceitful self-image, a dissatisfaction with one's place within the created world. Have any of you ever wished you were somewhere else, with someone else, were someone else? So this last scene in Genesis chapter 3 offers what I think is perhaps the most heartbreaking thing of all. God has to banish the man and the woman from the garden and from God's divine presence. They have tried to become like gods instead of the beautiful humans that God has created in God's own image, with God's own hands, and so they are exiled and cut off from the tree of life. The place that Adam and Eve were created and privileged to protect now has to be protected from them. And interestingly, the verb that's in this particular story, the banishing word, is the same one used to divorce a wife or disown a child. The humans were sent forth, but it was the result of their own choice. And we have been divorcing ourselves from God ever since. And there isn't one of us, if we're honest with ourselves, who can't resonate with this story. No matter how good we might believe we are, we know where those fault lines, lines are in ourselves, where the brokenness is. We suffer, we all do. 
and in comparison of what we were created for as this wonderful human race, we are broken and twisted, capable of inflicting unimaginable evil upon our brothers and sisters. You know, we know inherently that we were made to be people of God, in the place of God and dwelling in the presence of God. But we also know that we're not exactly as we should be, that we are often in a mess of our own making, a mess that we simply cannot fix on our own. And that's the point of the story of the Old Testament. The choice put before Adam and Eve is the same choice put before Israel every day and continues to be our choice today. Learn to listen to God and follow in God's ways, and then, only then, will we live The story of Adam and Eve makes this point in story form. Israel's long story in the Old Testament makes it in the form of historical narrative. And Jesus, Jesus shows us the way of redemption, the way out of separation from God, the path to healing and wholeness. Today's read through the Bible verse was in Revelation, and there's this wonderful image of God standing at the door knocking, wanting to be invited in to have dinner with us. It's a wonderful image. And I thought, you know, God waits knocking every moment of our lives, waiting to be invited into all of our conversations, wanting to be fully present, to fully feast with us, for us to be in God's company each and every day of our lives. That's the story that we as a church have to tell the world. Jesus is knocking. Love, perfect love, is ready to walk and talk and eat and be in our presence each and every moment of our lives. How will we continue to tell that story?